to Listening In, the National Counselling and Psychotherapy Society podcast. My name is Faye Blackwell. I'm the Head of Engagement and Development at the Society. In this series, we want to provide the opportunity for you to listen in to some of the conversations that I'm lucky enough to have every day, that is with a variety of wonderful people and organisations all working in the field of mental health and well-being. Please be aware this episode is centred around the topic of suicide and bereavement by suicide because today I'm talking to Amelia Wrighton, co-founder and CEO of Suicide & Co, one of the Society's organisational members. When Amelia and her colleague Emma discovered they had both lost a parent to suicide, they decided to fill a gap in service provision and set up a charity that provides free counselling to those who have been bereaved by suicide. An experience which has been described as grief with the volume turned up. Amelia describes the challenges of running a charity that has grief and trauma at its heart. She explains the important link between their work and suicide prevention And we end our conversation by asking the question, can good come from grief, especially this type of grief? We spoke together in early June and after sharing mutual frustrations about the continued cold weather, Amelia started by telling me about this year's choice of holiday reading. So, like, I'm ready for it to get on the plane and be like, okay, I'm going to read Jilly Cooper's new book. I saw it being advertised and I was like, oh my God, I don't think I've read a Jilly Cooper book since I was like 18. And I am just going to do it. Like, they're such good, easy reads. And I'm just like, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. I couldn't love it more. You, I, know, I know in my list that I sent you of things that we might want to chat about was, you know, what what do you do for self-care and, you know, what recommendations do you have for your own podcasts and books and stuff? Jilly Cooper would not have come to my mind. <laughs> okay. Okay. But it's also like, it wouldn't have come to my mind. I was just, I'm so in need of like a, of like a step change because I love reading business books. I love it. Um, But I really need, I need to like get out of the, out of the day today because I'm so much more effective when I do it's nice to have some things to look forward to though isn't it it's that this podcast for the main will be listened to I imagine by practitioners uh first and foremost and and other sort of organizations too and I think I think you're in good company I mean that's part of what this is all about it's 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 us all being together or us all understanding to some degree at least what the nature of helping other people is like whether you're just doing that one-to-one as a counsellor or psychotherapist or whether you're doing it as an organisation and that juggling of the day job with your own self-care and looking after yourself because you're giving so much of the time and most of the time, notoriously, I'm sure we're going to end up saying this every episode. <laughs> so I need to be very careful. But is that we're usually the worst for looking after ourselves. So, so is it, I can't take for granted that people know who you are, even though I know who you are. I'm lucky enough to know who you are. So, so can you just give a little brief nutshell of... of who you are and why you're doing all of this, why you're so exhausted from all this amazing work you do. Is that easy to put into a little sort of... So, I mean, in terms of Suicide & Co, so we have been going since July 2020 um, and we are an organisation that's just built to support those who are bereaved by suicide Um, and our biggest service and why we're so close with the NCPS is um, our biggest service is our counselling service um, where anyone over the age of 18 can access 12 sessions of counselling completely free of charge um, by our qualified counsellors, which is amazing. It is amazing. And 12 sessions as well, you know, it it shouldn't 
be amazing. It should be absolutely, you know, standard. But I know many people listening will recognise that actually free, 12 free sessions is quite extraordinary. Um, And again, we'll give people some understanding as to why the fundraising side of things and keeping that going is so important. But so what brought you to this place? What brought you, what gets you up every day to do this? Yeah, well, I mean, those are, I would say, two separate questions. What what gets me up every day to do it is the audience that are in need. Like, we, you know, our demand since January 2024 is up 65%. So, you know, that's about 70 to 80 people every month applying for new ca- for counselling. And that's not including, obviously, people who call our helpline, access our website. Like, the need is so great and was so unmet previously even though there were existing partners doing peer-to-peer you know it just they are incredible organizations but we need more like we need this is kind of the worst time can be one of the worst times in people's lives and without any support people are at significant risk of mental health deterioration and getting to a place of crisis now what brought me here is that right so I have experienced this firsthand I lost my mum to suicide when I was 19 um you know I was at university supposed to be having like the greatest time ever and you know my world was completely shattered by losing my mum in such a tragic way and um and ultimately my journey was very suppressed it was very kind of I had good family and friends but I really didn't feel like anybody could handle the emotions I was was navigating. I felt like the normal thing to do was to bottle it up inside and to not talk about it. And I wasn't offered any support either. And then when I did sort of show that I was struggling, I got such kind of like the white flag army coming at me. I was just scared of like, oh my goodness, you know, I, I don't know what I want. I don't know what support I need. But, um, you know, and, and for me... I, I, I was able to access counselling a year and a half after she died, mainly because I had already t- deteriorated my mental health into quite a bad place. And it was a fantastic experience for me that opened up a huge kind of a new area of my life that would be, you know, more understanding of the grief. Now, that didn't make it any easier to have conversations or, you know, I didn't follow any charities or anything like that. And so it was that lived experience that, kind of connected me and my co-founder Emma we met working in media for five years ago um and yeah we shared the same frustration and then when we did a big sort of analysis on the sector we just saw this huge huge gap like you know people breathe by suicide there should be major charities operating in multi-million pound systemic ways like I, I truly believe in in our model and what we're doing, and and that, yeah, that's kind of what brought me here and what keeps me going. I guess. Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? So, so a lot of this is in in honour of of your own experiences and losing your mum in that way, and recognising how hard that can be, and how unique experiencing grief as a result of a suicide can be because it really is in many ways very different isn't it 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 is and and I think like you know I mean every uh every person's grief is completely unique like you know even those grieving the same person is is a completely different thing as all practitioners will know I think what we do find is that, you know, that there are definite commonalities and there's definitely a, a sense in the audience that they feel like it's really different to other grief, which it, which it is for some aspects, but it's more about the identification of wanting to talk to somebody with expertise in this. You know, I have heard even clients say in testimonials, you know, I felt like my NHS counsellor couldn't handle what I wanted to say I felt bad I didn't want to bring up these and you know you don't want to do that you're the one that needs the help you want to feel instant trust in your practitioner that you know they can hold what you're bringing to the sessions and I think that that's a big part of what we do and what has been created in our system 
Mm. That's such an important point that, you know, just the, the narrative, that conversation, those experiences, the nature of suicide itself. And that's difficult stuff to bring. And of course, you're so right. People that might be feeling some really difficult feelings around that in their own right and in that own experience then come into the therapeutic space and may self-censor you know, may feel guilt or shame or concern for the practitioner and that importance of that, that therapist, as you so rightly say, being able to hold that information so closely and so gently, but so sort of, so firmly keeping that really secure and safe. Yeah, because some of the things that we we want to talk about and clients want to talk about, they're really difficult to say. And you know that the topic of suicide and really getting into that that depth is is intense for for anybody to have a conversation about and and I think if when you have a counselor who genuinely holds it in a non-judgmental way the power of of that experience is huge being able to be like oh well I'm not an awful person because I think when when people are coming to counseling in this type of way and I'm sure it's it's other things but obviously this is just my area of knowledge like if you've been surviving grief through the first kind of like four to six months we don't let people enter the service until they've been grieved for six months right so you've done that you've already got your walls your coping mechanisms built that means you're still alive right in terms of like you have found a way to actually physically survive so you've built up all of those then because of the existing stigma that arrives exists everywhere you've built up extra societal walls which means you don't want to embarrass anyone or you don't want somebody to feel awkward so you won't say those things and then those concepts that you are having maybe around blame or guilt or anger or do they feel regret or challenges of spirituality you know when those manifest and just ruminate on their own they can get to much deeper things of self-hate low self-worth and then for a counsellor to unpack, okay, well, let's get out of all the walls. Let's then get figure out whether these things were coming from previously to your grief or are they now? I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to do, right? Yeah. And I think that it is, so it, it's a really key reason why we only work with qualified counsellors who have like at least a couple of years experience in the profession. And we pay our counsellors. We pay them £30 a session. And, you know, I know it's not the market rate for everyone, but we have counsellors all across the uh, UK some are giving us discounts some that's what they they would charge in their local area and you know that, that everybody has a standardized rate and we will not we cannot work with trainees at the moment because we want our service to be somewhere where people can come and do really complex work yeah. and the other thing within that is you know this is an audience is at, actually kind of identified from research as at a higher risk of suicide themselves you know, like because that research has been done and the way that the topic of suicide is spoken about and can kind of be brought up in a session, it's super important that we have counsellors who can deal with that stuff, who have got skills in PTSD if the person has witnessed the suicide or found the person. You know, there's all at this level we've had to really upskill because uh, in our opinion, well, my opinion at the start of this was, you know, generalised bereavement services just aren't doing a good enough job. They're just saying, yes, we take people with suicide-related grief, but other, sometimes those people were being referred out because they were too complex. Or we've heard it so many times, and that phrase is literally so damaging, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, we just wanted to come in and really do it properly because I guess I'm rambling here, Faye, but, I mean, my, my moral belief in terms of preventing people from dying by, you know, poor... Uh, mental health mental ill health or is or suicide in general you know is if we can look at high-risk audiences or and provide kind of tailored support at that intervention after a trauma and stop or minimize that mental health deterioration we are minimizing the fact of them getting to crisis Mm -hmm. it's a lot easier tangible work to do so areas like gambling addiction domestic abuse suicide bereavement these are groups around life events not demographic groups but life events where we can go okay we can create a tailored intervention and if you get this at the right time and in the right way whatever that is 
you know, we should be able to prevent you needing to rely on crisis services. That's that's the whole point. Versus when we get people presenting unknown to us in the crisis system, it's incredibly hard to work that back. Yeah. And, you know, we're in a multidisciplinary agency world. It's it's hard. You're not you're not rambling at all, can I just like, everything you've just said there is is so important and so vital and and so true, um, sadly. And, and and to come back to what you said about people going into those perhaps more generalized bereavement services and essentially sort of being given the message what you're bringing is too difficult for us to handle. Is, oh, goodness, I mean, it doesn't bear thinking about, and I, I completely, you know, we, we both agree that, that it's absolutely the right thing to do to refer somebody if you don't have, you know, the competences or the training or the ability to work with their needs. But it is, what is that message sending to somebody? So it is really important that people experiencing this type of grief, and as you say, it's, it's not just grief, it's trauma, and that they need those specialised services such as, as those that Suicide & Co provide, you know, to, to help them through that. And, and I know you and I have talked before in the past in, in, you know, some of our previous meetings with each other about that link between being bereaved by suicide and being at risk yourself. And... And I think still that that can be a message that's lost. And, and, and I know you sometimes have found that frustrating with, with um, you know, with stakeholders and funders as well, not understanding that the service you provide in terms of somebody that's been bereaved by suicide is also about crisis prevention, as you've just outlined. It's, it's a link that still gets lost a little, isn't it, about how at higher risk some, sometimes people can be. I mean, it does. It does get lost. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, the first one is, you know, I find that stat very difficult as a person who is bereaved by suicide. I don't like it. Obviously, I don't like it. I don't like to hear I'm at a higher risk of suicide. I don't like to think that about my community as a whole because it's not representative of the whole community. But it is. It's, it's an absolutely definable thing that is is there 1000 percent. But, you know, our website, as an example, is there as a resource for people bereaved by suicide. But it's also what funders use to look at who we are. I'm never going to put that statistic on my website to sit because it, I don't feel it's a responsible thing to do with my main audience who are there for support. It, I just doesn't, I don't think it's a useful thing to do. So, so to pr promote it is, is challenging, definitely. Uh, and, and we're only four and a half years old and we organize it. Oh no, sorry, we're three and a half years old. Are we? We're four and a month. Oh gosh, who knows? Um, but, you know, we, we're we getting to our like grips with that statistic. But, but I think in, t in terms of the system link, well, it is very frustrating and it does get missed all the time. Um, and, and I think it's largely down to the, the kind of broadness of the term early intervention. Like suicide prevention as a sector, you know, I sit on the steering group for the National Suicide Prevention Alliance very proudly, you know, trying to kind of volunteer there and help as much as I can. But, you know, it's given me a great insight into how broad the suicide prevention sector is and there are some really key issues that I think are fundamental across everyone firstly it's a very immature sector that doesn't have a lot of evidence base or similar language and um, you know it, one of the biggest things I find frustrating is we act like suicide is one thing we act like we can prevent suicide by telling everyone that they need to talk more and you know, um, ask how other people are, which is just a ridiculous. I mean, the circumstances of how my mum died in comparison to a 14-year-old girl being cyberbullied on so, you know, that they're completely different interventions that are going to save those two individuals. And I believe in suicide prevention, but I think we're going very minimalist because we're almost dealing with like the backlog of mental health stigma and trying to like kind of work at this very broad level. And that's where things like early intervention come in. People define early intervention as going and teaching self-care to young men playing sports. 
I term early intervention as getting in after an identifiable life event, you know, or trauma and providing support mm. to intervene at that moment to stop mental health deterioration. They're not seen as the same things. And, and I think also comfortably in society, we prefer the first one versus the last, you know, versus the really, you know, the really dark areas of the sector. And that's where suicide having co is hard. Like we don't fit directly in <laughs> suicide prevention. And we don't also sometimes feel like we fit within grief. You know, a lot of the grief and bereavement sector is soft and loving and and everything like that. Even, you know, some areas of like pall- palliative care and end of life, I, it, sometimes it does feel like we're in a very different area of the sector and it can be difficult to find I guess to, to, we're very like hold hands with loads of people, but to find our kind of like, you know, bigger, broader sector um, and also kind of ring the bell for the kind of core stats as much as possible. It's really interesting hearing you describe it in that way, because as you described the sector, the grief sector, the mental health sector, all this intersectionality that's that's occurring and where you feel Suicide & Co sit, I was going to say within that, but that sense that you don't actually quite sit comfortably anywhere within it, I suppose sort of describes what suicide and grief by suicide in itself feels like, doesn't it? You know, just something slightly other. You're just sort of stood outside the door looking in to other people's experiences which might be similar to your own but never quite feel the same. And actually, you're so right, going right back to earlier in the conversation when you said about grief being unique itself uh, to each individual You know, um, I know you and I have talked in the past and just for a little bit of self-disclosure here, you know, I've got my own experiences of grief through suicide uh, within my family. And, you know, I know I've said to my children, we've all grieved the same person, but that doesn't mean our grief is the same. So there's so much about all this, which is about just sitting on the outside of it all and and that's a lonely place to be it's lonely it's frustrating and like I say it always feels like you're just looking in at the window at everybody else a little bit sometimes absolutely I mean it's super isolating within family dynamics sometimes the most oh my gosh in my lived experience of spirituality I'd be like you know I'm jealous and I feel distant from you because you're having this experience where you like are connecting with my mom and you're all of this it it, it can be isolating even within the closest circles 1000% and I do think it's really representative of what the grief is like and where we're at the sector and I can add two other layers as well to that the first one being in terms of like two things that's existentially mirror the the organization and the the loss we're dealing with the first one is like we're a national startup organization in mental health most startups in this space are local it's a completely different model um support network framework it's completely different so when i look at like where oh let's go and hang out with our other national charities okay well we're talking about like they're all on tens of millions of pounds in the majority like it's 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 very different the other thing is is that we are providing a service delivery model where we're paying for our counselors we're delivering 500 sessions a month at the moment we've delivered over eight and a half thousand counseling sessions in like three years you know we've built a model empowered by technology you know which i'd actually love to talk about later because it's really relevant for practitioners but you know, in terms of scale, we've we've done that. And, and the reason we focused on professional support is because that is so inaccessible. Mm. You know, community, going to a peer-to-peer group, all of these incredible community-based work, they need to happen, but they are not inaccessible. They're all free. You need to figure out where it is. You know, loads of them have amazing systems. If you haven't got one near you, they might even let you start one. You know, like SOBS, you, know, you might be able to become a SOBS volunteer and start a new thing. 
you know, but counselling is inaccessible because of price point. The average price across the country is £60. And also, how do you find someone with the right expertise? You know, we've joked about, like, not joked, but, you know, you look at the counselling directory and every counsellor is saying they do everything. Of course, like, you know, you've got amazing learning and you're going to say you do bereavement and, like, but does that mean you do suicide bereavement? It's hard, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I think it's, like, those two, you know, existential things, the inaccessibility of, like, what, and I don't have other charities I can look at to go, okay, cool, you're delivering thousands of counseling sessions too. What's over here? Because when that does happen, they're normally funded by the government, which we're not. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think if we're, we're definitely living in like the metaphor of like our own grief, even as an organization. Like, but I think we've turned that into a bit of a superpower. Like, our brand's really brave. Our team are really brave. Like we, we know that we're doing things differently, but we're, every decision we're making is super considered, backed up in data and our community lived experience. And yeah, we're just trying to go for it and continue to be brave. I love hearing you use the word brave because whenever we speak, that's always a word that comes to my mind. And even our conversation today, you know, you you name that stuff and you you voice those challenges and those frustrations with real bravery and courage and, and real determination to, to change it. You know, no wonder why you, no wonder why you feel so tired sometimes, Amelia. But, but it's, you know, it's extraordinary what you do. And, and, and again, to hear you use that word superpower, I couldn't agree more. And, and I know sometimes, and I've certainly had my own experiences of being a service user of organisations that have come from a lived experience sort of start and that's become something. And and it's it's sometimes that's quite complicated and not always successful. But actually, when, when lived experience compels somebody to do something like Suicide and Co are doing, like, like you guys are doing, and it becomes not about that person and their grief but it becomes about you know the subject itself that's when it goes to another level and that's when it's professional and that's when it's safe and that's when it's important and we've been really lucky in that you know I mean firstly the fact that like it Suicide Co. is not in memory of my mum and it's not in memory of Emma's father you know it is valuing the lived experience that we came with but you know, and the whole community that we built, our trustees, our original volunteers, you know, that we everything we've done has been committee style. You know, we have never used one person's lived experience to drive an intervention. And and I think it also helps. We came at this, you know, my mum died eight years prior to me starting this. Like it, this was this was based out of a different um a different founding. And and but, you know, in the suicide prevention world, there are incredible organizations that have been built in memory of people who died by suicide. And there is something to be said of how fast they go, how quick they kind of build and the, the public's emotion that they capture. It's 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 hugely valuable. I think we were doing something very different from the beginning with Suicide and Co. We wanted to create something that a service, I mean, it, it's rare that you look at an area and you go, oh, there's actually a really identifiable gap here. And that is what we did. You know, most of these organizations that aren't doing that, not out of fault of their own, but, you know, it's not about that for them. It's about adding to the pile and kind of trying to get more traction on it. Um, <clears throat> but I think that there's Sun Co. is an organization that we hope in years to come is just like a national staple. Like, yes, we all hope that suicide rates are coming down, but... It should be an organization that can live without me. We live without Emma, you know, just continue to kind of live and breathe. And I think what we've done with our ambassador network and people border is, you know, everybody feels like it's their organization that they're driving. And that's, I guess, what we want to keep. It's not like, oh, even though I'm normally the one on the podcast, it's only because I'm just doing this full time now. You know, there's loads of people that can, can kind of talk to what we're doing. Um, yeah. Is, is that lovely word community, isn't it? It's one of my favourite words. And it's a word I use an awful lot in my work with the, um, with the society. And I think 
if it's okay, I, what I really don't want is for people to just feel that all you do, you know, I say all you do, but, but it, it is just counselling services that you provide. Because my goodness, all anybody needs to do is go on your website and they will see so much on there, resources and events and all manner of different amazing and, and inspiring different projects that you do, the conversation guides that you have. I mean, there's so much stuff there. And, and, and the people that you work alongside, ambassadors you've talked about. Um, it, and it really, it's Suicide & Co. in its own little right feels like a community. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, so is there, can you help people understand anybody that isn't familiar? You know, outside of the counselling services, what else do you do and offer and your app and I mean, so much stuff? 100%. Well, so in terms of like the charity as an organisation, we've definitely got a thriving community kind of going. We've got loads of people involved with lots of events and, and, and like, you know, charity style, like being in a non-profit world, doing fundraisers and stuff. When it comes to service delivery and resources, there's kind of two lenses that we built around. And, and they're, they're the same way. They're just different ways of looking at it. One is like, you know, the numbers show that between six and 135 or even 435 people are impacted by one person dying by suicide. And if we think about that logically, you know, those six people in that nucleus are probably, you know, blood relatives, partners, you know, children, etc. And then that's what statutory services normally get built around. So the next of kin can act as counselling, but nobody else can, I think. And so when we looked at the audience, we were like, God, there's this massive community circle. And we've got this like circle kind of demo, um, illustration, which is like showing the different impact of these um of people that are affected. And and when we looked at that, we were like, God, there's so many, all of these people deserve support, but what they're going to need is going to be really varying. So they're not all going to need counselling. Some of them are just going to want to read an article or listen to a podcast or, um, you know, have, read a guidance about how to have a better informed conversation. So there, there's one side of things where we built our services based off of the fact that we don't just want to focus on those who are directly impacted. Because when, when you also focus on the broader runs, you you can make the experience of the people right in the nucleus even better as well. So you yeah. kind of do that as a sixth thing. And then the other reality was is that, you know, there, there are really varying levels of intensity of suffering. So, you know, you're either in a peak of grief, maybe right after the death or at a completely random time, or you're actually coping with daily life, but your grief is kind of niggling at the back of you. It's either right in your face or it's over here or somewhere there, right? And at those different parts of the journey, which can be years and years long, decades, you know, you're going to want different things. And so those two concepts we've pulled into what we offer. So the biggest area is counselling because that's the kind of, for us, was the biggest gap and the biggest inaccessibility. People can access that. They get 12 sessions, as I said. They can access it at any point of their bereavement. Then we have our helpline. Now, our helpline's under big development at the moment. It's really exciting we staff it by um, employees, they're suicide bereavement advisors, so they can chat to people about the practical and emotional stuff. And I think helplines seemingly feel like you need to be needing help or like in a moment of crisis. That is not our line. Like, yes, we get people calling us who are completely in distress with their grief or overwhelmed or whatever, but people can also talk for a confidential chat, like call for a confidential chat. You know, when you were doing this podcast recording and you're like, not an interview, it's a chat. That's what I want people to think about the helpline. Like there were so many moments where, you know, I wasn't in crisis, but I just wanted to talk to somebody that wasn't my family and friends. I just wanted to be like, God, uh, this person has just annoyed me so much because they said something so insensitive. Or, oh, I had a horrible dream last night and I don't want to call alarm, cause alarm bells across the family, but I'd love to talk to someone. You know, all of those things. I think it's like a great... And it's also the service where we can take people who need more than counselling. So counselling is only once a week, right? So if you're really in a peak of distress, uh, you could have suicidal ideation yourself. Then we work with people in the helpline and we can speak to them every day, twice a week, whatever it is. We work with them, we assign them a suicide breathing advisor and we do case work with them. So that's kind of like our highest intensity. Uh, and then we have our app. Our app is only on iPhones at the moment, but it's essentially focused around self-care and um, 
being there to kind of help with anxiety, sleep, stress reduction. Uh, I think it's most valuable if you're newly bereaved and you get it like instantly and you can kind of build like a real comforting uh, relationship with it to go back to and use exercises from it. But there, a lot of the resources are also on our website because it's not accessible on Android at the moment. Um, and yeah, those are kind of like the three biggest service delivery areas. I mean, our website and our app are a bit interchangeable. It's basically if you're looking for things that are softer, like books, podcasts, support groups, all of that, that then we kind of do um, focus. Um, we, we basically curated it in terms of like, I go to a load of websites and I just see a li- list of links. Like we're one of the links most of the time. But I don't actually, I then got to go and do the self-exploration myself. What we've done is less of that. We've just like actually picked on things that we have validated that we think are interesting or useful to our community and done it that way. And it's absolutely brilliant. I have to say it really is. Yeah, it, it's, there's so much on there. And it's like you say, it's, it's, it's without meaning to use sort of flippant language. It is like a one-stop shop. There's everything that you could possibly need depending on where you are or how you're feeling at whatever stage of your grief you are or if you know somebody that's grieving and again want to have that conversation or want to understand what they're going through and inform yourself in that way there's there's just everything on there um and 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 to come back to the app Amelia so are you say it's 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 sort of like a toolkit then is is would that be a, a way of describing it or is that not quite yes yeah, so the app is um it's free to download so i'd say the easiest way to kind of for people to get a version of it in that is just to download it it's on iphone and essentially it has actual exercises and programs so to help with things like sleep there's a seven day program you can enlist in it gives you different exercises to do right before you go to sleep there's standard meditation on there there's breathing exercises and it's got the functionality, like coaches you through it, like the mindfulness app would do. Um, and then there's areas for you to journal. I look at that specific area and I'm like, gosh, if I could have, I don't even like know where my journal was from that time or what I wrote. But if I could have like seen an app being like, why didn't you write how you're feeling? Like, I feel like it would have really helped. Um and then, and then a lot of the kind of signposting to books and podcasts and everything like that that's on our website is also in the app as well. So yeah, it's, it's like having your own little self-care um, mm-hmm. toolkit and you can favourite things that you personally find relevant and kind of go from there. I mean, it only launched in uh, October of last year and it, we haven't had enough time. It launched and it's out there in the world and then we haven't had enough time to like continue kind of adding to it and stuff like that. Like, oh, it is getting used and, you know, we did do used to research at the start, but I want it to be bigger and better, obviously. Would, would it be an appropriate then resource for perhaps any practitioners listening if they are working, um, you know, with a client that, that's going through this type of bereavement that would be a perfect place that they could signpost them to? I would always recommend signposting people to the website because there is so much on there, less mm. so than just the app. There is so much on there that I think it's really beneficial for, to let themselves explore. Like we've got just done a whole new navigation set on the website because I think, um, it, yeah, I, I just think they can find our social media. I mean, we've got over nine and a half thousand followers on Instagram. Like, there's so many more things that they can find through one link than just sending them to the app, which is a bit of a closed mm. section. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that, that, that does do referring on the app. But um, I, I would say for any practitioner working privately with somebody breathed by suicide, it's such added value you can give. Like, I've had private counseling, it was amazing for people that can afford it we would absolutely recommend it wholeheartedly. It'd be amazing. But um, having the extra support and the extra community and the destigmatization that can be done by our work that is hard to do from one person, I think, yes, it would be amazing. Um, yeah. Destigmatization. I mean, that's a whole other, that's a whole other hours chat, I think, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm very keen that this, this conversation is about 
Suicide and Co and the amazing work you do. And obviously, by definition, as we've as been clear, you know, that that involves talking around suicide. But but the stigma, it's so important to say it's still very much there. And there is still very much often a shame, isn't there? And and a guilt that people can carry that have been bereaved through suicide. Not everybody, but but some people in ways that isn't necessarily the same when they've lost somebody in a in a different manner to that. And that stigma, yeah, it still feels very prevalent. There's still a lot of work to do, isn't there, on that, I think. Definitely. And I think that's why working in a confidential setting with a professional to kind of like confidence build is so validating because, you know, to suddenly just be in a place where you can just, you know, overtake or stigmatise views or know what to say or feel like your you know emotions are okay I think starting in a professional setting but it's confidential is is the best way to do that I really do but I also think there's loads of stigma around counseling still especially in older generations my god like you know I speak to people every single week where like you know they'll go oh yeah I mean I think my daughter needs counseling but I don't need it and that, oh, that's so interesting that you don't need it. Like, how, how have you self-prescribed that, that you just don't need it and you wouldn't find it useful and you've never tried it before, but you don't like it? It's like there's no playfulness with with mental health. And I think that's where the stigma kind of really gets to. I've, I'm, like, in a frustrating moment at the moment. And, like, I can get quite existential. I do lots of different talks and stuff like that. And I'm like, yes, there's stigma, but there's also, like, no interest. Like people aren't interested mm. in the topic of mental health. And because of that, like we get low attendance to talk, amazing opportunities that businesses will pay people to go to. Then like we, we're putting this on in your working time and you're still not going to it. Um, because people aren't interested and they don't see it as something that I think that can necessarily benefit them or is going to affect them. And, you know, so then when we grown up with that lack of education when we do go something traumatic our natural instinct is just to trust what we know which is don't talk about anything and don't try and get support rather than okay I'm going through something awful why don't I try everything and just see what I actually Mm -hmm. like or why don't I look at everything and you know it's it's so so different um and I think that until that improves it's it's a blocker for sure definitely and all the more reason why communities like yours like ours like that joined community and speaking in this way is is even more important just keeping that narrative going keeping you know just keep saying the words keep using that word suicide you know is 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 really important really important so I mean can you believe we've got like eight minutes left (laughs) Where does it go? And I'm looking at that list of ideas of of, of conversations what we're going to have. And it's like, okay, where where did that go? Um, but but what about? So you, it, it's funny we we started right at the beginning talking about progression and future and moving forwards. Um, so how how do you see that? How let's let's sort of if we can you know, come come to a close talking about, you know, so many positives, you know, achievements and what you hope for in the future. And and I know one of the other questions, sorry, multiple questions, it's it's terrible all in one go. But anyway, um what what it, in your experience, whether that's your personal experience or what you witness in your work, can positives come out of this type of grief as well? So which is which is a difficult question. Okay, okay, we'll leave that one till last. So, so in terms of where we're going, um, you know, we it's all about scale for us. Like we've got an evidence base now of having delivered over eight thousand counseling sessions. It's working. We've got a model that's so scalable, and the reason for that is, you know, when I started creating this, I spoke to you. We spoke to loads of other people to go. Well, let's look at how other counseling services are working, and we also had it out externally. Um, provided by a private company for two years and we've learned a hell of a lot about the pain points of a scalable counselling model right and working with associate counsellors and when we went out last year for our counselling recruitment which you supported us in a mailer you know we had over 380 counsellors apply 
wow. which meant we got to be super picky. We took 63 to first round. We took 21 counselors on. Now, that when we took them on, before that, we had learned about the pain points, right? So counselors didn't like working with agencies because admin was overly arduous. They didn't get paid on time. They didn't get sufficient training for what they're doing. Communication, they were talking to a robot. All of these things, right? We basically learned all of those and said our counselor's brain, yes, we're client first, but our counselor's brain in this service delivery is our product. If our counselors don't feel community, they don't feel like they're being treated well, they don't know the information, they're getting added stress because of admin, it's just deteriorating our product. So we've made it really, really positive for the practitioners that we work with. And that has been empowered by technology. So our CRM system, our you know, client management system is so brilliant. We've also got a team of employees that support with admin. Like it's like a dreamy, or at least our clients currently are saying it's like a dreamy place to work and it's allowing us to scale. So, you know, our demand in January in terms of people applying for counseling went up by 65% and it has not relented, right? So that in terms of our awareness, which is, still so minimal, should keep going up. And what we have now is we have a model that we've created very consciously that allows us, if we hire more counsellors, that our capacity goes up. There's no mm. new buildings, there's no new blah, blah, blah. It just keeps going up and up and up in terms of what we can create. And that, and I mean that in terms of, you know, today, you know, I don't know, let's say 100 counselling sessions are delivered today in September, 1,000 counselling sessions could be delivered in a day. And we don't have a big change in terms of our infrastructure is just counsellors. Now, the big thing in a way is funding. So, you know, that that our income's up 89% this year. That's great. We need to keep going in that direction and we need to keep raising awareness. So for us, it's, it's all about scale. And with our kind of counsellors and our clients at the heart of, of our model and of what we're delivering, I think we kind of really have a, a foundation that, that should be scalable, which is exciting. Um, in terms of can good things come out of suicide related grief like a thousand percent I think that you know any traumatic event um when people kind of come through the other side they have you know added resilience added I mean there's the term of like post-traumatic growth right which I love and I don't like and I go back and forth and you know with as an organization we don't take a stance on it but I think from a personal perspective there's a huge uh, amount of that that I think can come out. And I also genuinely, more recently, am coming to the belief that there are so many people in our society who don't have any skills or kind of language in terms of tackling mental health uh, deterioration, be that from a life event, even, you know, a breakup or a loss of job or, you know, those types mm-hmm. of things, all the way through to something as, you know, severe and as a, suicide loss um once you've got the coping skills and you've taken the kind of steps of realizing oh you can talk about difficult subjects or you know you can um put things in your corner that will make this easier I think it only sets us up for kind of the future in terms of other crap that we're going to go through which is inevitable um and I also think the other thing it builds is our empathetic uh, nature and our compassion for others I think that and across loads of different traumatic events um you know we need a more empathetic compassionate society and I think that unfortunately those who have been through a lot um tend to have those skills in in abundance so mm. um I bloody love our community and you know I'm weirdly proud to be part of it you know it's not a club I ever wanted to join ever and I'd I'd get out of it if I could go back in time 100% but I'm in it and I'm very very proud to be part of, of a community of people who yeah can show incredible empathy for for themselves and for others. Oh Amelia I couldn't agree more it's such a for me it's it's nearly 20 years down the line so it's a it's a long time in the past and it's still very present in our lives in many ways but but very often that's in a positive way. And you used the word superpower earlier. And much like yourself, if I could go back in time for my own experience and it not to happen, of course, that would be incredible. And yet here we are with this experience. And for me, I think I I came out of that experience thinking, 
I'm never going to experience anything worse now. I don't sweat the small stuff in quite the same way I used to. Um, yeah, I think I think there's just a, a, a not not across everything. Of course, you know it doesn't make us completely bulletproof, but at the same time, there is a, a, a fearlessness for, a, a, a personally that I can say I think I developed as a result of that that I wouldn't have had before. In fact, I definitely didn't have before. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's strange, isn't it? It is, and I, and I also think you know I, I do I like absolutely do want to make this point that I think to get to that place that we are both in I do think it takes work I think it takes mm-hmm. accessing support available and leaning into resources that can help like I really do I like service access is cool like and obviously we're talking about this for people who have chosen to help others for a living so I know you know it as an audience but I, I just think like beyond belief in in the bigger picture you know it, people seeing that and seeing the they often see the success stories of like oh you know I've got someone and now I'm doing a major fundraiser or da 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 or they see a really really successful person successful person being really open about their lived experience but I that is interesting but how did you get there what was the process I think exposing more things around you know counseling what it's really like and 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 educating we're doing much more psychoeducation now I think is only positive absolutely absolutely Thank you so much, Faye. I wish we could no, do more together. No, thank you. Speak every week. I absolutely love chatting to you. The door is always open. It's always open. Thank you to Amelia from Suicide & Co for joining me today. And thank you for listening in. If you would like to know more about the work of Suicide & Co, then all the links you'll need will be in the show notes below. This podcast is brought to you by the National Counselling and Psychotherapy Society, a professional home for counsellors, psychotherapists and over 120 wellbeing organisations across the UK. Autonomy, diversity, creativity and community are at the heart of what we do. We are creating a positive space for conversations with people who share common beliefs and goals, because together, our voice is louder. If you would like to know more about the NCPS, please visit www.ncps.com for more information. And please remember to follow and subscribe so you are always part of the conversation.